Um, welcome to my talk. Um, my name's Molly and um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here today te well, telling you a little bit about me and my work as a repairer. Um, sadly, it can't be in person because it would be really nice to be in Falmouth again. Uh, so, uh, but hopefully this will do. And um, the, yeah, this is kind of one half of what I'll be doing for the, uh, for the behalf of the repair form for Falmouth. Um, there'll be a talk and there'll also be a workshop later on in the week on the 5th um, of March. So that'll be live and we'll be able to interact a bit more and uh, you can ask me some questions at the end. Uh, but for now, um, yeah, I'm just going to tell you a bit about me and what I do. I think I'm going to um, break the talk into three sections. So the first bit will just be the intro, a bit about me, what I do on a day to day kind of level and then also um, how I kind of came to teach workshops in repair and what I learned from it. Uh, the second uh, the second bit will be a bit more about that, the workshops, the philosophy behind repair, why I find it interesting and so, and so uh, important in today's modern climate. And then the third bit will be about my book, uh, which is called The Art of Repair and it comes out on the 4th of March. So you might, it might be out by the time you're watching it, this. Um, so this book is a collection of stories, techniques and history all about uh, repair, mostly textiles, um, and the benefits of it in our fast paced lifestyle. Um, it's illustrated by me and um, Hopefully I'll be able to fit in a little bit about that as well because the process of illustrating it was quite interesting. Um, I'm, it was terrifying having to illustrate my own book. Um, it's hard enough doing a book cover for anyone, um, but when you know it's yours you have to like it and it's very difficult. It was difficult. Um, but I'm really proud of it and I can't wait to share it with everyone properly. Um, so at the end I'll um, yeah, be sharing some little segments and hopefully a little reading. Um, so yeah, um, I'll just begin by telling you what I do. So I am a illustrator, I'm a freelance illustrator working in London. Um, I graduated from Falmouth uh, University where I studied illustration in 2014. So that's nearly seven years ago now, which is a really long time ago. Um, and yeah, since then I've basically been working at becoming a freelance illustrator. Um, and I also am a textile repairer, so it's a bit of a niche job um, and I'll explain in a minute how kind of it happened. But my, uh, yeah, my, ge my general day to day job is always a bit different. So I'll either be working on a commission, doing illustration. So um, I work with magazines um, on sort of spot illustration sometimes. I've done book illustrations, um, but I also do my own kind of just artwork, dry point printing. Um, all sorts really and um, it's always changing it's always different um, the other part of my work is repair so I work as a client based repairer for people so people send me their broken things to my studio and I investigate them repair them myself by hand always by hand stitching and then I send them back um, I also teach workshops, so I teach workshops on repair, teaching um, traditional hand-based techniques inspired by Indian and Japanese uh, methods, which are really ancient and um, simple, but fascinatingly uh, addictive and um, can be a really kind of meditative and mindful act when you um, when you develop that skill. So. I go around teaching these workshops and um, through those workshops I um, I kind of start collecting stories and from people about their broken fragile fabrics and garments um, and it was kind of there that I really developed an interest in the power and um, importance behind repair as a general philosophy not just as a really useful skill. So. Um, how did I end up being a repairer and, a, and an illustrator? Um, I think I'll just begin at, uh, at university and graduating, um, but, um, but kind of as a, 
as a prelude to that, uh, I, um, I've always been interested in drawing, painting and art, but I've also uh, always been interested in embroidery and slow stitch work. Um, from a young age, I um, went to a Steiner school for, from when I was a little child to about 10 years old, so baby to 10 years old. Um, and Steiner is basically a, um, a kind of alternative form of education. So everything is very much hand-based around hand skill from kind of, uh, we were taught how to do pottery and um, there was a lot of hand work lessons so there was embroidery there was felting there was mosaics there was um weaving um and so from a really young age i learned how to kind of wield a needle and thread um so that kind of hand-based skill was really um was really early on for me but also adding to that with my parents so i grew up in a kind of very much making and mending household um my dad is a special effects model maker so he used to uh so he kind of was, is a real kind of genius when it comes to to mending and making um he used to make models for wallace and gromit um which is my favorite claim to fame and my mum was a hat maker so she used to um have a sewing room in my in the childhood house i grew up in so i was always around um yeah clothes textiles cloth needles thread paper you know, so we would always be mending things uh, when they broke. Uh, and this installed something in, in me that kind of has obviously lasted a long time. Um, but until later on, I didn't think too much about it. It was just something I knew how to do. Um, so anyway, back to Falmouth illustration, which I loved and um, was fantastic in terms of developing my skill and my um, awareness of composition and colour. Um, it was a real good start off um, for me and after graduating in 2014 I really wanted to move to London. You couldn't get more of a different place from Falmouth to London <laughs> but um, yeah and um, uh, like Nigel told me in the one of the first lectures I had at Falmouth was if you want to be an illustrator you have to think about the other job you're going to have to have I don't know whether you were told that too, um, but he was absolutely right. Uh, it's very difficult to be just become an illustrator out of uni. Um, you know, you have to develop your portfolio and build relationships with clients, and uh, yeah, and you just have to work really hard at your at your skill and style. So I was aware of that um, going coming to London and knowing that I had to support myself to pay rent. So I just got a job at a cafe, like most artists have to do. Um, and I also worked as a nanny, um, but so that was and that was for a few years. And while I was doing that, it kind of it, and I was a recent graduate. I was sort of using the city as a guide to develop my kind of style. And I was drawing a lot. I, I've always loved doing um, sketchbook drawings from life. So I would go around to the city, around various spots of the city, drawing people walking around and and. Um, going to galleries and um, yeah, trying to use the city as much as possible for my practice, drawing from statues in the V&A and that kind of thing. So it was really, it was a really good uh, informative section of uh, recent, uh, yeah, graduation. And um, of course, at some, at eventually I got really bored of doing my, my part-time jobs and really wanted to find something that was more skill based and um, uh, and that suited my my uh, my my skills, but also my desires to create, be creative, and um, I started looking outside the box because you need a job. So what can I do as a job, and as well as illustrating, uh, which isn't coming in every day? So I wanted to. Um, I started looking at, at basically uh, like set design, costume, um, places that hold a host of freelance menders or not menders of makers and creators. Um, but I didn't want to just go and be a graphic designer or do digital work because I've I've always wanted to work more physically. Um, so I started just working with costume makers um, and asking around and. Um, 
eventually helping just doing hand sewing on sets and um, for costume and clothing and film for music videos that kind of thing and this is where my early sewing skills really came into what well, came to help me out basically it was really useful to know how to do that kind of stuff even though it was really basic stuff um, and then um, as this was going on I started um, I repaired a pair of trousers for my friend um, who just asked me if I could do some work because uh, he was aware that I was working with with textiles and um, and I mended these trousers. Um, they were really broken, torn and tattered all over from just uh, overuse. And um, and after I gave them back to my friend, they just kept coming back. That uh, not the trousers, but more. So he would he was like, oh, that's great. I love that. I love them. And oh, I'm so pleased that you know his feedback was. He was just so pleased that I could have I could save them because they were his favourite trousers. Um, and then he told his girlfriend and then, you know, people started tell sending me their broken clothes and it sort of hit me um, that actually everyone has a broken uh, thing in their wardrobe they can't bear to throw away. Um, something special or sentimental or maybe it's just something that fits them really well and they just can't replace, like a favourite pair of jeans. And uh, it's this idea that drew me closer to what repair really is and what it means to people, um, that it's so much more than a basic skill that most of us have forgotten about. Um, it's what it can make you feel inside and how it can reconnect you to the things that we own. Um, and not only that is when when I started teaching repair workshops, uh, it was really clear that knowing how to mend something yourself can install a confidence in your own abilities. Um, and this is something that was taught to me quite early on. So I didn't think too much about it, but when I was teaching it, um, it, it was really fascinating and uh, uplifting and moving to see how this affected um, that's my phone. How it affected people in a um, in a deeper way. So, so <laughs> that's thrown me off. Um, but yeah, so I uh, I think that's where it all really began for me. Um, and uh, and from that, I started working with shops. So I was approaching different shops asking to be their repairer because I just needed the work. So I was looking for kind of this to be my other job. Um, I was saying, I'll be your in-house repairer. Uh, I think this is something people really want. I think they need, they, they people want their clothes to be mended. They don't want to just simply replace them. Um, because of course, in the modern, modern world we live in, everything is replaceable and uh, high street shops make it very easy to do that. And as do uh, online, online shops. Uh, you can replace anything in a minute and it can be delivered to your door the next day or the same day sometimes. Um, fast fashion is basically like fast food. It is relentless and blisteringly fast and uh, the waste that is produced from the mass production is just astronomical. Um, it causes devastation to the planet. Uh, it, it, clothing com like clothing factories in various countries uh the pesticides that are created to dye the clothes uh it all goes into waterways and ruins the agriculture obviously the, the uh, i'm sure most of you know about the kind of conditions that people have to work in in these factories you know it's kind of it's very much a kind of fast paced endless relentless uh money making system in place and uh, it's all thanks to consumerist values and um, capitalism essentially. Um, so repair today really means something like it never meant before. It's taking back control of the things that we buy um, and it all starts really simply actually in terms of just buying less, choosing well, caring for our clothes and then repairing them and learning to repair them yourself um, 
can it yeah like i sort of said can install not just a confidence in your own abilities but also a connection with the things that we own and the things that we have um so that's kind of where my interest began and uh, and where it was it was suddenly i was aware of the need that people had um so i started working with these shops and they would provide these these uh, clients for me where they, they I would go and pick up um, I worked with a shop called egg um, which is a shop in Knightsbridge and um, they they their clients would come in with their broken clothes and I would pick them up repair them and give them back and I specialize in delicate fabrics now because of egg so they they make these beautiful silk papery style dresses that kind of look a bit like um, eggs and um, and I, I sort of taught myself how to mend them. So I never had any professional training in mending. It's something that I've just developed and um, and kind of figured out myself over a lot of time and a lot of experience and things going wrong on my own clothes. Um, and it was sort of at this point when I was collecting these clothes and sending them back and noticing that this wasn't something that was a fad, it seemed to be something that was growing. Um, I was collecting these stories, so I, I began writing down um, the stories that came with these clothes. Um, a cardigan with 200 holes in it, um, which was irreplaceable because the woman who owned it uh, bought it on a really special holiday where she met the man she was gonna uh, marry. Um, or it would be, a really beloved uh, coat that belonged to a loved one who passed away um, and it was like the last thing that they gave to the person who, who now owned it. Um, or it was a pair of trousers that were handed down from like a mum and um, from the 80s or whatever. And every story was interesting because of the way that the person told it to me and the connection that they obviously had in that cloth um, which was irreplaceable and priceless um, but not only that when things came through my door or I collected them clothes have um, a real sense of the person who normally wears it wears it um, you can tell so much about clothing and the way that uh, the person wears it on, on a day-to-day -day level I mended a, a boiler suit last year that was indigo and beautiful and covered in like creases and tears all over it and it, it was a really big job but I barely knew the person who gave it to me I just knew that she loved this boiler suit and she wore it every day um, but there are certain signs and signals of a person how they wear it and, and, and what they do every day so the right knee was torn but the left one wasn't which meant that she kneels with her right knee. Um, she obviously walks quickly. There was a kind of momentum in the suit that was um, telling me that she was a busy person. Um, but it's not only that, it's the, the smell. There is a smell and a scent to clothes, um, usually nice, <laughs> sometimes not. Um, but the things I get are normally washed and clean. They just have a real smell and it's not just a laundry smell. Um, there's a story in my book about a night dress from a woman called Rebecca um, and I've never met her. It just came in the post um, and it smelt of a sort of stone house with children in it, um, porridge and, uh, and kind of brackeny countryside and um it just had a presence um and interestingly i i uh i learned recently that in south korea they don't have charity shops because they believe that the soul of the person within the clothes that used to wear the clothes is still there so um they have hand-me-downs within the family but to wear something from someone else entirely is really weird um and I know what they mean. Uh, it doesn't stop me from wearing charity shop clothes because they're the best. Um, and also vintage clothes are great because the quality is always way better than, than today's uh, clothing, which is often mixed with polyester fibres made cheaply um, and uh, won't uh, is not built to last, unlike vintage materials. 
But um, but I find that fascinating. I think that's really interesting that sort of the soul of the person is in the clothes, uh, and I, I I know what I know what they mean. Um, so moving on to the next the next section really um, where I'm going to talk about workshops. Um, I was I was collecting these clothes. It was turning into a bit of a business in terms of working with egg and collecting these stories. But I was doing all of the mending myself. I then started talking to Toast, the clothing company, about um, teaching and lecturing um, and uh, sharing these these skills with uh, the Toast customers. So um, we're going to move on to that next. So, uh, yeah, my workshops with Toast. Um, this was a, a really crucial part in my uh, story, really, um, because this is where I learn a lot about uh, the benefits of teaching and sharing these basic skills. So uh, the way it worked, this is a few years ago now, uh, we sort of went through a different number of processes, but eventually we came to this kind of uh, general process uh, way of doing it, which basically involved me going to every store in the UK, there's about 17 of them, um, a, a sort of dotted along kind of like three months. Um, and I would uh, carry a big suitcase of cloth um, and needles and threads and all my materials. And then I would set up in the store with a little table and about three people to five people would join me for a workshop. And I did three in a day and it was really tiring. <laughs> um, but it was really interesting and um, and eventually uh, I, I realised the best way of doing it was just to simply do a stitch sampler together to learn a basic skill, which is again what we'll be doing later on. Um, so I would teach them these, uh, the, the, well basically a technique uh, which is derived from a traditional method called sashiko stitching which is a Japanese um, ancient technique from the kind of 1500s. Um, so just to briefly explain what that is, um, in the west uh, what we usually do when there's a tear is we cover it up with a patch so we get a little patch and we fold the edges over and we just stitch neatly around it. The problem with that is that the tear is still there underneath and it continues to grow and it gets worse and then you have to do all sorts of patching. Sashiko is a, re is a reinforcing method. So you've got your tear and you put a patch over the top of it, but rather, the, rather than on top of the tear, traditionally you put it behind the tear from the inside of the cloth. And then you just get a needle and thread of cotton and you stitch a rectangle of stitches over the broken cloth um, onto the new, stitching through the tear itself, but not pulling it together, just stitching a, sort of a host of stitches that kind of look like a patch of braille, um, a line of little stitch work. Um, and you'll be able to see a few examples of that in the, um, in the PDF I'm gonna send, um, or, por or portfolio. Um, so it's really simple stuff and it's really easy to do and you can basically do this method on most things. So anything that's a woven fabric, you can apply this method to. And this is what I was using for egg, clothes made of silk. It was the same thing I would use for a pair of, pair of trousers or jeans. Um, and this is what I was teaching in my workshops and um, the effect it had on the the customers was really interesting. Um, in today's society, we live in a very fast paced, uh, busy, we live busy lifestyles, which are um, bent on kind of speed. And well, what we value in the Western world in general is speed and growth, expansion. Um, and we take little time over sort of actually the kind of when it comes to the things we buy uh quality um and care which of course was once the only way of doing something was to do it by hand and take care over it um this i believe has left us with a feeling of disconnection um a sense of 
uh, anxiety, we don't really know where anything comes from, how anything's made, where it's made, uh, who made it in the first place. Um, it's the same with food. So it's kind of, it just gives us a sense of displacement, I think, without even realising it. So it, we're just, we're just in this kind of little bubble. Um, and I believe that the effect of this uh, creates, uh, gives us a sense of disconnection. Um, we rarely use our hands anymore, which is again something we would have done a lot more of uh, even if we were working in factories or um, if we worked on the fields and the countryside then of course we would have been much more hands on. Um, but even in the past we would have handwritten things, um, letters would have been handwritten with a quill and ink um, and none of that is with us anymore. We are all on computers um, and engaged in a screen and I mean you all know this. Um, so when it came to um, my workshops, the positive effects seem to be really the kind of opposite of this problem that we face of just disconnection and anxiety. Um, people were able to slow down um, and find a kind of moment to connect with the thing that they'd brought in. Um, the hand stitching technique itself is quite, it, you have to do it slowly, it, it can't be rushed. It's a, generally it's a stitch at a time um, and just pulling the thread through and weaving it back at, you know, the, out again is a very kind of mindful, in, engaging act, which you can't really be distracted by something else. You have to sort of engage in it. Um, and the, the fact that they were mending something themselves was really uh, touching to see um, how they reacted to it. They'd leave with a sense of ownership, um, positivity. They say, said they told me that the session was quite a mindful experience. They felt like they they could actually just like you know their shoulders dropped and they could relax and talk to each other because that's something that sewing skills have like in history have always involved groups of people, generally women, but um, of just conversation. Um, a recent Harvard uh, medical uh, sort of examination into slow skill based handcrafts was uh, was a test was recently done and um, they proved that the that skills like or, or techniques methods like hand sewing weaving knitting all had the same effect which was to uh, lower blood pressure and slow in the our heart rates um, and this was the evidence for me of just being able to see how um, how everyone left with a feeling of well-being but more than that um, and the thing that really I'm particularly interested in is the confidence it gave them in their own abilities um, I believe mending something anything yourself can give you a sense of achievement because um, you feel more confident in being able to look after yourself. It, it makes you feel more resilient and reliant. Um, I remember when I was always driving to Falmouth from um, Somerset, where I grew up, and um, my uh, and I, I used to get very anxious. I was anxious about the, my car breaking down because it was really crap. <laughs> it was just a rubbish little car. Um, luckily, it never happened, but I was always really worried about it. And I remember telling my dad and him telling me that he uh, he learned quite early on that he was a bit weird. He's um, kind of, a, uh, what would you call it? Uh, he's almost like an engineer with his job. So he, he, would t he, he basically once upon a time took a car apart and learned how it worked and put it back together. And that is going a bit beyond my... Uh, <laughs> my skills and specialities but anyway because he did that and he knew how how a car worked and and um and ran it made him feel really confident on the road when he was driving his car and i mean a small version of that is that i was taught how to change a, a tire in if it 
if it broke when I was driving and it did give me a sense of like oh okay well if I if my tire breaks at least you know I will be able to fix it on the side of the road um, and I believe that this is you know a small version of that um, mending a hole in a pair of jeans can give you that sense of achievement and pride but also kind of reassures you that actually you can mend the things that uh, break in your life and um, and you can do it beautifully um, this uh, this leads on quite nicely to um, the sort of philosophical side of things um, which I which I go into in my book so um, for the next section I'll be starting there okay so I'm gonna introduce you to my book um, and the first place I'm going to start is um, actually right at the beginning, pretty much after the introduction. I start with um, a Japanese philosophy known as Wabi Sabi. So that's uh, that's the page, and um, I'm just going to read a little section for you because I think it plays into what we were just talking about. Um, Wabi Sabi: To everything there is a season. Japanese proverb. Wabi Sabi is an ancient Japanese philosophy defined at its simplest, there is no precise equivalent in the West, as beauty in imperfection and impermanence. It calls on us to appreciate the aging process, the crack in the vase or the wrinkle on the face are there to be accepted, even celebrated, rather than seen as flaws that need to be disguised or removed. Likewise, materials should be reclaimed and reused rather than discarded. More broadly, wabi-sabi is a way of looking at the world. So that's just a little section. Um, and I think that I, uh, again, watching uh, these people in these workshops reflecting on their beautiful broken things, um, it gave them a sense of actually uh, the philosophy of things breaking in nature, which is so denied in our culture in the West. Um, can be recognised and reevaluated within a broken knee or a hole in an arm. Um, we see our, we can see ourselves in our broken things, um, and I think this is a really important element for a lot of people to um, to kind of think upon or note or or take he uh, heed over. We. Um, in we are kind of in the western world which i think comes into it quite a lot for me is um the idea of perfection and it also um and that comes into play in education when we're educated um as children so um in terms of aesthetics uh when the romans came came along and they built our cities perfection and symmetry and uh, things being eternal and lasting forever were the top, uh, at the top of the list. Uh, it was important that everything looked a certain way and that everything was made of stone and everlasting materials. Um, and this is the way we look at ourselves. We value the new and the eternal and the everlasting. Um, and we shame the old and the withered and the wrinkled and the grey and the ancient broken things. Uh, we don't see that as something that should be celebrated, we see that as something that should be shamed and more than that just should be avoided at all costs. Um, but yeah, the problem is that we are, um, we aren't uh, eternal and uh, we're not immortal we all age um, which is something I kind of touch on at the end of the book which I, I think I'm going to read to you in a, in a bit um, so yeah so that's the kind of aesthetic idea of it um, but in terms of education it's the same uh, thing that I again I noticed is that uh, when we're at school everything has to be right and it has to be perfect and mistakes are uh, aren't encouraged so we normally are told you know I remember because I went to a standard secondary school and I remember everything being about grades and exam results um, if you don't get a certain grade you're going to basically be a failure and you know you won't be as good as your mate and you should all be going for A's or A stars in everything 
which was very stressful and very um, anxiety inducing um, and gave us well it gave everyone around me I remember a sense of just dread um, I had it I was just I'm dyslexic um, so I was really I was, was you know rubbish at English and maths and um, you know luckily looked upon art and textiles as a way of kind of feeling good about myself um, but and, and I always kept that quite close to me and was you know but I I feel like it's in, it's this it's something that lasts when I was teaching these people at in my toast workshops who were primarily from the ages of sort of 30 to 60 years old they were they were kind of comparing themselves to each other and you know saying oh well, my lines aren't very straight I, they're not good enough that kind of thing and it's um it's and that 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 feeling is such a strong everlasting uh negative way of looking at your own abilities and work and i think it stops people from branching out and trying new things and making mistakes because making mistakes is so important and i think that it is this that's kind of in the uh the essence of repair is that broken things happen and we all break and we all make mistakes and they don't things do not need to be perfect um that's what's so beautiful about repair is it's celebrating the you know the withered broken little bits of your jumpers or clothes for me a, a, a sort of hand knitted jumper that's gray with a darned red patch on the elbow is beautiful um and there's something very touching about it um so that was kind of what led me to um collecting this information uh my research in workshops and um i wanted to put it in a book um so here it is um and i go into this a little bit about the workshops in the introduction but mainly uh the innards of the pages are a collection like i said at the beginning of various things so there's there's the history um so that kind of involves all sorts of things. I'm just going to flick through it. Um, from the Make Do and Mend movement of World War II, which um, was, uh, let me try and get to it. Um, so yeah, this is, um, this is a section. Um, and uh, the quote at the top is um, a World War II saying, which, uh, is much it's it's quite similar to keep calm and carry on use it up wear it out make it do or do without and basically um just to give you a brief background into into this moment in time um in britain clothes were rationed um and we we were given uh, coupons or they were given coupons my uh, my grandpa uh, pa and grand grandmother would have uh, been children but um yeah our, our kind of relatives would have been involved in it and uh because everything was being rationed and um and clothes were really expensive to produce and all the factories making them were kind of concentrating on the war effort so making stretchers and clothes for the war soldiers tents etc people had to learn how, really focus on caring and mending the clothes that they had um, so there was a little pamphlet set out by the, uh, by the Ministry of um, Information and um, teaching household uh, kind of tricks to kind of avoid moths and mend clothes. Um, so there's a bit about that. There's also a bit, a, a chapter on Japanese um, Sushiko Indian Canther blanket. Um, which are made out of discarded quilts and saris, um, all all mushed together with with thousands and thousands of uh, running stitches to create an unwadded quilt, um, which they use for all sorts of things, from bedding to blankets to prayer mats, to just wrappings to saddles, all sorts, uh, and it's all made from discarded cloth. Uh, Levi's, the uh, the first sustainable piece of cloth. Um, or not piece of cloth, clothing, um, and uh, 
it, these are, this is fascinating. This is stuff that I kind of researched. Um, they were the first sustainable item of clothes because uh, before the before denim was invented, it was just woolen trousers basically, which didn't last for very long, and um, would have been expensive to replace. But when denim came along and Levi's and Strauss patented this, the classic five oh ones, they were used. Uh, by miners and cowboys and uh, jockeys eventually because they just lasted for a really long time um, and you could mend and patch them back together so you know which we still do now so there's a bit of that and there's also um, techniques so um, there's a sort of section on how to darn your your favorite jumpers um, there's also a bit about the sashiko stitching, which I'm going to be teaching you later on, um, reinforcing broken collars and, and cuffs, that kind of thing. Um, and then also stories. So the stories that I have collected over time, so uh, cer certain things of my own uh, garments. This is my ye yellow linen jacket. Um, which once belonged to my auntie and then it belonged to my mum and now it belongs to me and it's a real irreplaceable item patched all over the neck and shoulders um, and um, I, I patch and repair it all the time it's it's something that has, has become deeply uh, deeply precious to me um, and it's almost a marker it's almost like a living quilt so I kind of each patch is from a different moment in time a different a different tear um, but more than that I've collected stories from other people so you remember the boiler suit I mentioned before this is actually in the book so here it is in its kind of broken glory um, and um, as well as the nightdress that I mentioned as well. So I've collected these stories and um, and this book is essentially um, no, never, it's not really one thing, it's a collection of uh, of all of the things I've learned about repair and why I think it's so important. Um, but it should be seen as an inspirational guide more than anything else. It's, it's not um, it's not going too hard on the environmental aspect um, and it's not it's neither mainly about the techniques it's about what you can get from and gain from repairing something yourself um, and teaching these useful skills um, I also wanted to just tell you a little about the illustration process because you're illustration students so I imagine you'd be it's you know that's of interest to you. Um, what was really interesting about this is, um, so there's illustrations dotted throughout. Um, let me just show you some at the beginning. They're quite abstract. So um, my work is often looking at figurative uh, moments, so I love drawing people, but I decided early on that I didn't really want to illustrate this book in that way. I wanted it to be calm and quiet in nature like the writing itself so I developed sort of these really quiet abstract sort of shapes and almost uh, experiment ended up experimenting with collage um, and different shapes um, which was a surprise I didn't actually plan it uh, that way but it kind of organically happened um, and I think it really suits the style and the feeling of the book. Um, and the way that it ended up coming about is by when I was making the cover for this book, which is the first thing I did, uh, it was really, really scary <laughs> and difficult because I, I would have chosen something quite plain and just on its own, but the publishers needed it to be eye-catching and, um, yeah, Specific. They had real specific things. They wanted it to be a collection of, of sewing tools. And I didn't want it to... The, one thing that was really important to me about this book and the idea of repair and sewing is it shouldn't be just for people who already know how to sew or are interested in textiles. This is for everybody, and I believe that it's a skill that is often shied away from by, um, by yeah, just... Uh, all, oh, I don't, I don't know how to explain it. Um, 
it's a very female orientated uh, skill sewing um, throughout history but also today and I wanted to make it more universal um, and I feel like the illustration element of that was really important to me it's so easy to just do some stitched lines and some scissors and make it look twee and I really didn't want it to look twee I wanted it to look strong and simple and organic and clean and clear and unbiased um, so while I was trying to make that happen I started cutting little I, I did lots and lots of different drawings and tried and was looking at colour I knew that I wanted the colour the cover to be just two colours really um, otherwise it was just going to get too complicated for me to make so um, I started cutting out these collages in different forms of colour and shapes and like there'll be scissors and a, a quilting collage and all that kind of thing and I started putting them together um, in squares um, and eventually I found the cover in, in amongst those shapes and different, um, in different sort of experimentation. And then I, uh, once I'd done the cover and put that together, I had all of these little bits of scraps of, of sort of pink triangle and some needles and some pins, um, a, a sort of a, a little stitch, stitch pile of, or a little painted sort of square of stitch work. And I kind of started putting them together and was like, actually, these kind of look right. They look how I need the book to look. Um, they are from different, they're from different drawings, but actually they work together as um, a whole. Um, and so this is basically an example of one of those collections. And um, it, it works for me because it's not, they were never intended to be together and yet they work together and I think that that really uh, sings true to the, the essence of the book. How putting old fabric with new fabric, patches of pieces coming together. Um, so there's also some illustrations of the techniques but pretty much um, it's quite basic and simple and uh, plain. Um, I can't wait for you to see it yourselves if, um, if I'm lucky enough for you to, to own one. Um, okay, so I, um, I've probably spoken enough. Um, I really can't wait for you to join me for my workshop and, um, and t see and talk to you a little bit more. Um, I thought I would end this talk with the contemplation at the end of my book. So I wanted to write a, um, a final note on the essence of what I was trying to say. And uh, it wasn't really a conclusion, so I've called it a contemplation. Um, so this is an exclusive reading. <laughs> I'm gonna have a little sip actually. So, contemplation. Perhaps when we find ourselves wanting everything, it is because we are dangerously near to wanting nothing. Sylvia Plath. <clears throat> Today we are in an environmental emergency which requires us to be mindful of the waste that we produce on a daily basis. It can be hugely overwhelming to contend with our personal footprints, but the but there are some simple ways that we can reduce the waste we produce and it always starts with a moment of thought and asking ourselves, do I really need this? The most sustainable form of clothes are the ones that already exist. Try and buy clothes from charity shops and vintage shops. Vintage is great because the quality from the past is often superior, which is probably why it's still around. And if you decide that you do need something new, will you want to treat yourself? Buy good quality clothing that is made to last and will be worth repairing when it comes to that. Buy less, choose well, care and repair. It is a privilege to be able to choose good quality clothing and this can be a contentious issue. If you live in the developed world, mass market high street chains have made cheap clothes affordable to everyone. And this isn't always a bad thing. There is nothing wrong with buying budget clothing if you have limited options, but if you can learn to reuse second-hand clothing, you are making a big difference. 
The important thing is simply to be conscious of the decisions you make and stay mindful of the collective benefit or harm that you're engaged in. There are lots of ethically driven clothing brands that are doing their best to find better ways of sourcing, making and selling clothes resourcefully and sustainably. You can find an ongoing list of these companies, big but mostly small, on my website under the Art of Repair reading list. For me, repairing a pair of jeans or an old jumper is more than simply mending an item of clothing to give it new life. There is a lesson within the broken fibres we are stitching back together that we might apply to ourselves. In our modern society, we are actively encouraged to fight the process of ageing. We are told that ageing is bad and unattractive and that we must avoid it at all costs. The problem is that, like our clothes, we all age. Our bones become brittle, our skin carries scars and sometimes stitches from accidents along the way. Our hair becomes thin or grey and our joints begin to seize. We all break from time to time, but we also mend with the help of time or a doctor. We carry the knocks of life on our bodies like an old, much-loved, patched pair of trousers. Our wrinkles are a sign of time, of weather and of life. And this should not be shamed, but celebrated. And here's a little drawing at the end. So that's a little bit about my book. And um, I, um, I hope that you've enjoyed this talk. I really enjoyed being able to make it for you. And um, I really look forward to seeing you for my workshop later on. Thanks so much.